Our keynote speaker is Dr. Bob Bowman, and he flew 101 combat missions over Vietnam. Uh, he's a man who's been married. I think he just had his 50th anniversary. Is that right, Bob? His 50th anniversary Friday. I called him a few months ago, and I said, Bob, I said, Bob, we want you to be one of our key speakers. And he said, when's the date? I want to come. And I said, well, it's on the 24th and 25th. He said, well, my 50th anniversary is on the 20th. Uh, 23rd, and we got about a couple hundred guests coming, all our friends and family, tuxedos, whole nine yards. You know, that's a big event. How many children do you have, Bob? Is it eight? Seven. I'm envious of this guy. I mean, th this guy's rich. That, that's real wealth, folks. And, 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 but but he, he said, you know what? I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to go. And so he flew out here Saturday morning after being up till 1.30 in the morning with his guest and then putting everything away. He's here, and we really appreciate him joining us. And it's, uh, what, Bob Bowman for Congress or Bowman for Congress? 2006. He'll tell you all about it. The point is, the point is this guy is, a, is, is just an amazing American. And think about it. He's running for Congress as a Democrat. He's got a chance to win. Bob Bowman has a chance to win. We should support him. We should get the word out everywhere we can. And I'm just, again, so honored to have him here to speak about 9-11. I know he's going to spend some time talking about intercepts and how NORAD stood down with his specific uh, knowledge on being an interceptor pilot. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bob Bowman, father of the Star Wars program, years before Ronald Reagan announced it. All right. This is incredible. Good job, sir. We're honored to have you. Bob Bowman. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you again. I know I've seen a lot of you in Toronto and in New York and Washington, D.C. and Chicago and now here. The 9-11 Truth Movement is not only alive and well, it's growing and it's on its way to victory. This morning I gave out a bunch of my business cards. I've got hundreds more. I'm not charging for them. <laughs> Please, everybody, get one if you want to be in contact with me. It's got my phone number on it, rings in my house. It's got the website, bowman2006.com. Get involved in uh, my campaign however you can, and get your friends involved as well. I alluded briefly this morning to the old story, Mo and Joe walking down the street. Mo says, I've been told the main problems in America are ignorance and apathy. Do you agree with that? And Joe says, I don't know and I don't care. Well, we do have a problem with ignorance and apathy. And the question is, how do we get rid of it? Let me give you a couple of true stories. Yesterday, at the Melbourne, Florida airport, waiting for my flight here, I was sitting near a woman and her husband and kids and whatnot. They'd just gotten back from a Disney cruise to Central America and the Bahamas. I gave her my card, the big... Uh, fancy one. And uh, she started reading my issues. And then she says, well, I believe President Bush did the right thing going into Afghanistan and Iraq. He had to do something after 9-11. God, I love a good straight man. So I say, well, sure, but Afghanistan and Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein were bitter enemies because Saddam had a secular state, not an Islamic one. You know, when I taught at the War College, 
the official U.S. government textbook for the region, praised Saddam Hussein as the most enlightened leader in the Middle East. He had done so much for his people in terms of education and health care and religious freedom and rights for women. And it was all true. Yeah, he was a dictator, but he was our dictator until we needed a new enemy after the Soviet Union disappeared, a new excuse for our huge defense budget. <clears throat> if we really believed, I told her, that there were 19 Arab hijackers, why didn't we attack Saudi Arabia? And if our government had evidence against Osama bin Laden, we should have indicted him and brought him to trial. The Taliban offered us Osama bin Laden if we would give him a fair trial. The truth is, there's a lot more evidence against people in our government than there is for Osama bin Laden. Then I started talking about 9-11 truth. And she said, well, you've certainly given me a lot to think about. And then about 45 minutes later, we were on the plane. And she walked back about 10 rows from where she was seated to talk to me. And she said, Thank you for what you're doing. I hope you get elected to Congress. We need you. Truth one, ignorance and apathy zero. <laughs> then the guy next to me says, you're running for office? So I give him a card. Turns out, he's from a tiny village in Alaska, hundreds of miles from the nearest road. The only way you can get there is by flying in and out. And he runs a air taxi service taking tourists to isolated spots to hunt grizzly bears and moose. On 9-11, one of his pilots was flying to pick up a hunter and bring him out of the wild when all non-military aircraft were supposed to land. Before he knew it, two F-16s were alongside ordering him to land. There was nothing but mountains and pine trees, and <laughs> he couldn't even land that super cub if he wanted to. The F-16 zoomed up into the air, and he thought, well, they're gone at last. Next thing he knows, whoosh! They're coming straight at him, and one goes on either side of him. Just scare the pants off of him. Well, <clears throat> after hearing that little story, I turned to my seatmate and I said, isn't it funny that they could find and intercept a tiny single-engine super cub in the middle of nowhere flying below radar, yet couldn't intercept four airliners flying around the Northeast for nearly two hours? Like I said, I'm an old interceptor pilot. I know the drill. I know what you can do. I know how long it takes. And I knew that if those pilots had been alerted on time, they'd have gotten there. They'd have gotten there 20 minutes 
before whatever hit those towers got there. And they'd have been there 30 minutes before whatever hit the Pentagon got to it. They were not scrambled in time. There was an inordinate delay. Now we know at least part of that was due to all of these exercises simulating exactly the same thing happening that morning. We know at least part of it was due to the fact that most of the interceptors that normally protect the Northeast Corridor were out over northern Canada or out over the Atlantic chasing ghost aircraft on radar, false blips. In those exercises directed by Dick Cheney. If our government had done nothing on 9-11 and just let normal procedures happen, the Twin Towers would still be standing and thousands of dead Americans would still be alive. This is not incompetence. It is treason. And you know what? He agreed. Truth too. Ignorance and apathy zero. And all this in about two hours. So how do we change things? How do we get rid of ignorance and apathy? One person at a time. But we must speak out. We must raise our voices. We must speak truth to power. And then, of course, there's Alex Jones. He abolishes ignorance and apathy on a grand scale, maybe thousands at a time. But you know what? He can't do it alone. We have to do our part, even if it's just one person a day. We've got to do it, and we will. Now, I've got my own way of reaching people. I'm running for Congress. And... And already, several of my articles have been reprinted in the Congressional Record. I've drafted legislation, lined up sponsors, and gotten bills passed. Just think what I can do when I actually get there. I want to take the 9-11 Truth Movement mainstream in a big way. As I said this morning, it's time for the 9-11 Truth Movement to move out of rented hotels and into the halls of Congress. And I've already lined up co-sponsors for legislation initiating a truly independent investigation of 9-11 and for articles of impeachment against Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, and Rice. <clears throat> you know, they say it doesn't take a rocket scientist to run our government. Nevertheless, I am one. I'm also a career military officer, a former executive in government and industry. I've been a stuffy college professor, a song and dance man, a radio talk show host in three different states, three different times, an itinerant preacher, and of course, a husband to the same wonderful woman for 50 years. As Alex told you, we celebrated our golden anniversary Friday night. 
And we had our seven children and 21 grandchildren and guests from all over the country there in Melbourne, Florida, celebrating a mass at the Patrick Air Force Base Chapel and then a dinner dance at the Indian River Colony Club, which is a military retirement community. Now, needless to say, getting here wasn't easy. Well, I've been a lot of things in my life, but one thing I have never been is a politician. And I'm not about to start now. <clears throat> There's a whole bunch of us, ordinary citizens, mostly combat veterans, mostly Democrats, we're running for Congress for the first time. We want to kick the professional politicians out of Washington and have a government which serves the people for a change. Now, I'm not going to stand up here for another half an hour and try to convince you that 9-11 was done this way or done that way or try to show you more evidence that uh, things didn't happen the way we are told. You know, what can I add to the kind of stuff you've heard from Dr. Stephen Jones, from Alex Jones, and from all the others in this marvelous conference? So what I would like to do for you is put 9-11 in perspective because it is part of such a big picture. Most Americans don't understand what's been done to them. Now we have a great country. The United States is number one in the industrialized world number one in our use of the world's resources, number one in the production of pollution, number one in the gap between the rich and the poor, number one in deaths by gunfire, number one in teen pregnancy, number one in poverty among the elderly, number one in citizens without health coverage, number one in child poverty, number one in homeless veterans, and number one by far, in citizens behind bars. We've got a larger percentage of our black population in jail than South Africa did at the height of apartheid. We're the world's number one debtor nation, number one in the creation of new billionaires, number one in school dropouts, number one in poverty, homelessness, hunger, divorce, suicide, and oh yes, number one in military force, nuclear weapons, and military spending as much as all the other nations on earth combined. This also makes us the number one object of fear and hatred in the world and therefore, along with our friends in Israel, the number one target of terrorists. We are not the target of terrorists because they envy us or they don't like our democracy or our freedoms or our human rights. Clinton once, I was so ticked off at him when he said that they hate us because of our democracy, our freedom, and our human rights. They hate us because we deny freedom, democracy, and human rights to people in the third world. We also lead the world in the number of hours worked per family because real hourly wages in this country are now a third, in real terms, a third of what they were in the 1950s. 
Now, a lot of people may be shocked by that. They say, well, our economy is great, and we've got low unemployment, and they're creating all these new jobs. Of course, one of my sons has three of them. <laughs> you can't support a family with one job anymore like we did in the 50s. It takes two wage earners and three jobs. Is that because we're so much less productive than we were then? Baloney! Productivity has doubled over and over and over again. Our workers are the most productive in the world, yet they take home the smallest percentage of the wealth they create. If worker pay in this country had kept up with executive pay, the average worker would now be making over a million dollars a year and the minimum wage would be $171 an hour. If we in this country still got the same share of the wealth we create with our work as we did in the 1950s. No more, just the same share. Every worker in this country, including the garbage collectors, the people who mow lawns, the people who flip hamburgers, the people who watch our kids, every worker in this country could support their family with one job working two days a week. That's what productivity has done. But we don't have it. Because all that wealth we create doesn't get to us. They call it trickle-down economics. They pump all the wealth to the top and it's supposed to trickle down, but it never does never does. What do you call a country whose principal exports are wood pulp and scrap metal, whose principal imports are manufactured goods, and whose fastest growing industry is building and operating private prisons? A third world country, right? Yeah. That's what we have become in its drive to protect the far-flung financial interests of multinational corporations, our government has abandoned our principles and fought wars of aggression against small countries. It has overthrown popularly elected leaders and installed puppet dictators who sell out their own people to the global robber barons. It has squandered the goodwill purchased by the blood of our youth in the defense of democracy in World Wars I and II. In its unilateralist arrogance, it has abandoned the ideals championed by our forebears who founded the United Nations. It has violated the legal framework established by our greatest generation at Nuremberg and in its phony war against the terrorists its own policies have created, our government has overturned the constitutional protections given us by our founding fathers in the Bill of Rights. In its drive toward a corporate New World Order, it has sold out our workers, our families, our environment, our children's futures, and the American dream. And when it needs an excuse for another corporate war, it kills 3,000 of our own citizens on 9-11. What went wrong? Why are our workers paid such a tiny percentage of their true worth? Why are we the only nation without a national health program? Why are our high school graduates two years behind their counterparts in other countries? 
Why are we hated by so many around the world? Why do we have hundreds of thousands of troops patrolling foreign lands and supporting foreign dictators? What's going on? The answer is, we have lost our republic. Legislators no longer represent the people who elect them, but the corporations who finance them. They answer not to their constituents, but to the K Street lobbyists who line their pockets and fill their campaign coffers. In return, these government officials have undone decades of hard-fought victories against the robber barons of the 19th century. For years now, through both political parties, by the way, the world's billionaires have directed U.S. policy for their own personal profit. This has included agreements like NAFTA, CAFTA, and the WTO, falsely portrayed as supporting free trade, but in reality promoting free investment. Overturning U.S. laws and putting American workers in competition with those in the third world. It has also resulted in a series of wars from Iraq to Bosnia to Kosovo to Afghanistan to Iraq again. Wars which are never in the interest of those fighting them or of the families left behind. Wars which only serve the insatiable greed of the global investor class. And still they don't have enough, so they bring us a 9-11. We now have a government which serves the interests of giant agribusiness, giant pharmaceutical companies, giant insurance companies, giant weapons manufacturers, giant oil companies, and all the other global robber barons of the 21st century. Losing out are the rest of us. Increasing numbers of American families in poverty, even those who work. Immigrants working for slave wages, small businesses forced into bankruptcy, seniors unable to afford their medications, especially after Part D for disaster, disappearing family farmers, what's left of a dwindling middle class, and especially our brave young men and women sent around the world to kill Arabs for the oil companies. Corporate power, what Alex calls the elite, power over our political system, over the media, and over most aspects of our lives is the greatest danger we face today. Curtailing this power and restoring it to we the people is our greatest challenge. Now those of us who dedicate our lives to truth, peace, economic justice, and environmental preservation can make little progress in our struggles so long as ultimate power is in the hands of those who profit from deceit, war, poverty, and pollution. <clears throat> those are the ones who brought us 9-11 and who want to control every aspect of our lives. We must reassert the sovereignty of we the people. Over the billionaires and over their hireling bureaucrats in the corporate New World Order. 
And that's why dozens of us non-politicians, combat veterans, are running for Congress. We want to take back America by becoming a citizen's Congress, serving the needs of the people instead of the greed of the multinational corporations. I started recruiting these folks last November. I published a newsletter, Take Back America, in which I issued the call for candidates to run for Congress, pointing out that the president, no matter how bad he is, can't do anything unless Congress pays for it. Congress, who are supposed to be representing us, has the power under our Constitution, and by God, they better start exercising it. Now, when I issued that call, I had no intention of being a candidate myself. And I looked in our district trying to recruit some younger, healthier person to run for Congress. Well, after a few months of trying, the Democratic Executive Committee finally, just all over me, convinced me there wasn't anybody else, and I had to do it myself. So here I am. I'm now part of the Band of Brothers, the Fighting Dems, and those fighting for a Citizens Congress. We're dedicated to upholding the Constitution and Bill of Rights, number one to campaigning and governing on the truth, number two, and number three, to the service of the people. All the specific issues that we may stand for come from those three basic principles, the Constitution, the truth, and service of the people. Now, on my website, bowman2006.com, I have pages and pages and pages of issues, just about any issue you want to mention, I covered there, which proves I'm not a politician because a politician wouldn't do that. They don't take a stand on anything unless they're forced to. And they say it's not very smart. You have, take a stand on 50 issues. Every one of them is going to tick off somebody. And I said, that's all right. I believe that people running from office should have to take a position on every issue and put it in writing. No more of this bait and switch stuff. Political candidates should be in computer parlance, WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. And by God, most of them aren't. I want to just mention a few of the specific issues that, uh, that I think are very important in addition to 9-11. One is electoral reform. The immediate need, no, number one, most important right now, is to outlaw all means of voting which do not result in a paper ballot that can be counted. You've got to be able to count it, recount it, audit it as necessary. That's the only way we can have any semblance of democracy in this country. Most important besides that, instant runoff voting at all levels. 
proportional representation, making Election Day a federal holiday, real campaign finance reform with public funding of kids. and truly nonpartisan apportionment, no more of this gerrymandering. Yes. Whatever it takes to prevent more of the stuff we have seen, we must once and for all sever the connection between big money and political power. Once that's done, everything else becomes possible. Power to the people. Then we can have, in the richest of all nations, we can and should have the ability to guarantee every American access to a good education as far as their talent will take them. One of my sons has been a physician now for about 20 years, but he still has $300,000 in student debt to pay off. We shouldn't have that. They ought to be able to give back by giving four years, six years of community service to our country, and their education is free. A decent job at a living wage. Not just a minimum wage, a living wage. Now, you know, they created the minimum wage not too long ago, but if it had been indexed for inflation to keep up with the standard of living, the minimum wage today would be over $14 an hour. When I get to Congress, I'm going to propose a minimum wage of $15 an hour, indexed for inflation. And I'm tired of 50 cents out of every one of our health care dollars going to pay profit and overhead for insurance companies. Whether we like government programs or not, in some cases it's the best way to go. The overhead of Medicare is about 1%. That's a heck of a lot better than 50%. We could expand Medicare to cover prescription drugs, eyeglasses, hearing aids, mental health, long-term care, and the whole nine yards. And gradually expand it to cover infants and prenatal care and then children and then people over the age of 50 and gradually everybody. If we covered everybody, we could pay for it with less than we're paying now if we kicked the blood-sucking insurance companies out of the business. And, of course, we should be giving every American the undiluted protections of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, and that means getting rid of the Patriot Act. Fear of terrorism is not going to make this a police state. Now, you know, we've at times had a government with bad policies. I think this is one of those times. But, you know, we're a good people. 
What we need, what we have long needed, is a government which reflects the value and the goodness of the American people. Our values and goodness are not reflected by a government which uses your money to train death squads in the techniques of torture, intimidation, and assassination. Whatever they call it, the School of the Americas has been responsible for unspeakable atrocities wherever its graduates have gone, and it must be closed. If I were president, I would order the students at the School of the Americas to be shown the films Oscar Romero and Panama Deception and then sent home for good. Yeah. Our values and goodness are not reflected by a government which gives most favored nation status to the butchers of Tiananmen Square and places an illegal secondary embargo on the impoverished people of Cuba. The embargo of Cuba must end and we must have human rights and what is right and workers' rights at the forefront of our dealings with China. We desperately need good advance information on the activities of Al-Qaeda, that creation of the CIA. And anyone who wishes to do us harm. But our values and goodness are not reflected by, and our security is not enhanced by, an organization which promotes instability, insurrection, tyranny, torture, terrorism, murder, and war around the world in our name and with our money. If the CIA won't stick to gathering information, it should be abolished. Yeah. Our values and goodness are not reflected by a government which sends its youth around the world to kill the sons and daughters of working people in other countries. Our values and goodness are not reflected by sending our children to the Middle East to kill Arabs so the oil companies can profit from selling the oil under other people's sand, making us the target of terrorists. We must speak truth to power. And the truth about 9-11 is that we don't know the truth about 9-11, and we should. What we do know is that the most unbelievable of all the wild conspiracy theories is the official one told by our government. And the truth about its bastard child, the Iraq War, is that it was not caused by faulty intelligence. It was brought on by manipulated intelligence and deliberate deception. This war has nothing to do with weapons of mass destruction or freedom or democracy or human rights or disarming Iraq or defending America or fighting terrorism. It has to do with oil, it has to do with money, and it has to do with raw imperial power. No more Iraqs. No more Kosovos. No more El Salvadors. 
These are not isolated incidents of stupidity. They're part of a long, bloody history of foreign policy being conducted for the financial benefit of the wealthy few. This is a new form of colonialism. It endangers our national security, it wastes our youth, it mortgages our future, and it is wrong. We should use the men and women in our armed forces to protect our borders and our people, not the financial interests of Folgers, Chiquita Banana, Exxon, and Halliburton. Yeah, the Constitution, the truth, and service of the people. And truth includes the truth about 9-11. And like I said this morning, we've got to move this movement out of the rented hotels and into the halls of government. We need a truly independent investigation. We need full disclosure of all evidence that our government has been hiding. We need identification of those responsible. We need their indictment and we need articles of impeachment. And if, as I suspect, there was complicity in 9-11, we need trials for treason. When I joined the Air Force a lot of years ago, I took an oath to protect the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that includes a renegade president. We must take back America. We must have a government that gives more than lip service to the Constitution. We must have a government that honors the truth, and we must have a government that serves the people. We must build an America at peace with the world and with its own people. An America that seeks not to be king of the hill, nor subservient to the World Trade Organization, but to be a responsible, sovereign member of the family of nations. An America that is free of the threat of terrorism because it is no longer feared and hated around the world and because we've rooted the terrorists out of Washington, D.C. We must build an America that leads the world, not just with military might, the way PNAC would have it, but with its vision, its compassion, its democracy, its freedom, its productivity, its standard of living, its treatment of its own people, and its goodness. That's the kind of America our people deserve. And working together and with God's help, that's the kind of America we will become. God bless America, and God grant us regime change in Washington, D.C.
And the question is, how do we get rid of it? Let me give you a couple of true stories. Yesterday, at the Melbourne, Florida airport, waiting for my flight here, I was sitting near a woman and her husband and kids and whatnot. They'd just gotten back from a Disney cruise to Central America and the Bahamas. I gave her my card, the big uh, fancy one, and uh, she started reading my issues. And then she says, well, I believe President Bush did the right thing going into Afghanistan and Iraq. He had to do something after 9-11. God, I love a good straight man. <laughs> so I say, well, sure, but Afghanistan and Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11. Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein were bitter enemies because Saddam had a secular state. Not an Islamic one. You know, when I taught at the War College, the official U.S. government textbook for the region praised Saddam Hussein as the most enlightened leader in the Middle East. He had done so much for his people in terms of education and health care and religious freedom and rights for women. And it was all true. Yeah, he was a dictator, but he was our dictator. Until we needed a new enemy after the Soviet Union disappeared. A new excuse for our huge defense budget. <clears throat> if we really believed, I told her, that there were 19 Arab hijackers why didn't we attack Saudi Arabia? And if our government had evidence against Osama bin Laden, we should have indicted him and brought him to trial. The Taliban offered us Osama bin Laden if we would give him a fair trial. The truth is, there's a lot more evidence against people in our government than there is for Osama bin Laden. <laughs> then I started talking about 9-11 truth. And she said, well, you've certainly given me a lot to think about. And then about Forty-five minutes later, we were on the plane, and she walked back about ten rows from where she was seated to talk to me. And she said, thank you for what you're doing. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Bob Bowman, and he flew 101 combat missions over Vietnam. Uh, he's a man who's been married. I think he just had his 50th anniversary. Is that right, Bob? His 50th anniversary Friday. I called him a few months ago, and I said, Bob, I said, Bob, we want you to be one of our key speakers. And he said, when's the date? I want to come. And I said, well, it's on the 24th and 25th. He said, well, my 50th anniversary is on the 25th. Uh, 23rd, and we got about a couple hundred guests coming, all our friends and family, tuxedos, whole nine yards. Yeah, that's a big event. How many children do you have, Bob? Is it eight? Seven. I'm envious of this guy. I mean, th this guy's rich. That, that's real wealth, folks. And, 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 but but he, he said, you know what? I'm coming. I'm, I'm going to go. And so he flew out here Saturday morning after being up till 1.30 in the morning with his guest and then putting everything away. He's here, and we really appreciate him joining us. And it's, uh, what, Bob Bowman for Congress or Bowman for Congress? 2006. He'll tell you all about it. The point is...
The point is, this guy is, a, is, is just an amazing American. And think about it. He's running for Congress as a Democrat. He's got a chance to win. Bob Bowman has a chance to win. We should support him. We should get the word out everywhere we can. And I'm just, again, so honored to have him here to speak about 9-11. I know he's going to spend some time talking about intercepts and how NORAD stood down with his specific uh, knowledge on being an interceptor pilot. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Bob Bowman. I hope you get elected to Congress. We need you. Truth one, ignorance and apathy zero. <laughs> then the guy next to me says, you're running for office? So I <laughs> give him a card. <laughs> Turns out he's from a tiny village in Alaska, hundreds of miles from the nearest road, the only way you can get there is by flying in and out. And he runs a air taxi service taking tourists to isolated spots to hunt grizzly bears and moose. On 9-11, one of his pilots was flying to pick up a hunter and bring him out of the wild when all non-military aircraft were supposed to land. Before he knew it, two F-16s were alongside ordering him to land. There was nothing but mountains and pine trees and <laughs> he couldn't even land that Super Cub if he wanted to. The F-16 zoomed up into the air, and he thought, well, they're gone at last. Next thing he knows, whoosh! They're father of the Star Wars program, years before Ronald Reagan announced it. All right. This is incredible. Good job, sir. We're honored to have you. Bob Bowman. Thank you. It's so great to be here with you again. I know I've seen a lot of you in Toronto and in New York and Washington, D.C. and Chicago and now here. The 9-11 Truth Movement is not only alive and well, it's growing and it's on its way to victory. Yeah. This morning I gave out a bunch of my business cards I've got hundreds more. I'm not charging for them. <laughs> Please, everybody, get one if you want to be in contact with me. It's got my phone number on it, rings in my house. It's got the website, bowman2006.com. Get involved in uh, my campaign however you can, and get your friends involved as well. I alluded briefly this morning to the old story, Mo and Joe walking down the street. Mo says, I've been told the main problems in America are ignorance and apathy. Do you agree with that? And Joe says, I don't know and I don't care. Well, we do have a problem with ignorance and apathy.